Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll see how that compares at the end of the evening. Huh? <laughs> Good evening. I am Stephen Leacock. Now, I have dispensed with any kind of uh, formal introduction of myself this evening because of uh, past experiences I have had with the people, chairmen, uh, presidents of various organizations and groups who have introduced me in the past, or I should say, have tried to introduce me in the past. But I really should say who have had a great deal of difficulty in introducing me in the past. I might as well come right out and say it, most of whom who have failed completely at introducing <laughs> me in the past. Here are a few examples. Number one. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us tonight a gentleman who is to lecture to us on Homer. <laughs> Homer. <laughs> I don't quite see what it is. Oh, oh, oh thank you very much. <laughs> on humor. <laughs> now, this is the first of our series of lectures for the winter. As you all know, our last series was not a success. In fact, we came out at the end of the year with a deficit. <laughs> so this year, we are starting a new line and trying a new experiment of cheaper talent. <laughs> After which there is a great clapping of hands and enthusiasm. Once I arrived in a town in uh, eastern Ontario and found to my horror that I was billed to appear in a church. I was to give readings for my works. These are humorous readings. And I felt a church was hardly the right place to get funny in. So I explained my difficulty to the pastor. I see, he said, I see. But I think that I can introduce you to our people so as to make all that right. <laughs> when the time came, he led me up onto the pulpit platform of the church. It was a big church. <laughs> the audience, sitting in half darkness, reached way back into the gloom. It was packed full and ab. Absolutely silent. <laughs> Dear friends, I want you to know that it will be all right to laugh tonight. <laughs> laugh heartily. Laugh right out. Laugh just as much as ever you wanted to. Because when we think of the noble object for which the good professor appears tonight, we may be sure that the good Lord will forgive any one of you who will laugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have to tell you how that night went. <laughs> but this man, this pastor, is not as bad as the man who says. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've never met the lecturer before, but I've read his book. I've written 19 books. The committee was kind enough to bring it over last night, and um, I didn't read all of it, but I did take a look at the preface, and I can assure him he's very welcome. He comes to us from a college called... What did you say the name of that college was? You came from? McGill! I said, ah, yes, he comes from McGill, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I've never heard of McGill myself, but <laughs> I can assure him he's very welcome. He's to speak to us on... What did you say the name of the subject was you just... 
It's a humorous lecture, I said. <laughs> ah, yes, it's to be a humorous lecture, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll venture to say, it'll be a rare tree. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm only sorry that I can't stay for it myself, but I have to... <laughs> I have to get over to the town hall for a meeting. So without further ado, I'm going to let Mr. Well, the lecturer get on with his humor. You know. To one experience of my tour as a lecturer, I shall always look back on with satisfaction. I nearly had the pleasure of killing a man with laughing. Now, lecturers have often dreamed of doing this, but I nearly did it. <laughs> the man in question was a comfortable, apoplectic-looking man with a, a merry, rubicund face, the kind of face you only find in countries that don't have prohibition. And he was seated <laughs> at the back of the hall, and he was laughing uproariously. And all of a sudden, I noticed something had happened. He, he fell over sideways onto the floor. <laughs> and a small group of men gathered about him and picked him up and carried him out, a silent and inert mass. Well, as in duty bound, I went right on with my lecture, but my heart beat high with satisfaction. <laughs> I was sure that I had killed him. You can imagine how high my hopes rose. When a moment or two later, a note was passed to the chairman. He came up on the stage, asked me to pause a moment or two in my lecture, went to the podium and said, is there a doctor in the audience? Well, the doctor rose and silently went out. The lecture continued, but there was no more laughter. My aim had now become to kill another one of them, and they knew it. <laughs> They knew that if they started laughing, they might die. <laughs> a moment or two later, a second note was passed to the chairman. He rose and said rather gravely, a second doctor is wanted. <laughs> well, the lecture continued in deeper silence than ever. They were all waiting for a third announcement. It came. He rose and said, if Mr. Murchison, the undertaker, is in the audience, <laughs> will he kindly step outside? Well, that man, I regret to say, got well. Uh, disappointing as I know it is to hear, <laughs> he recovered. I sent back next day from London a, a telegram of inquiry. I did it, so I have to have proper proof of his death. Uh, and I received the following reply. Patient doing well sitting up in bed and reading Lord Haldane's relativity, no danger of relapse. <laughs> you know, few people realize how difficult and arduous public lecturing can be. They see the lecturer get up onto the platform and they think him happy. After about 10 minutes of his talk, they are tired of him. Most people can tire of a lecturer in 10 minutes. Clever people can do it in five. <laughs> and sensible people never go to humorous lectures at all. <laughs> well, you know, I was watching a magician once who had a very interesting experience with a member of his audience. Ladies and gentlemen, having shown you that the cloth is absolutely empty, I will proceed to take from it a bowl of goldfish. Presto! And all around the hall, everyone was saying, oh, he is wonderful. How does he do it? Till the quick man in the front row was heard to whisper, he had it up his sleeve. <laughs> And then the people next to the quick man whispered, oh, yes, of course. And then soon, everyone around the hall was whispering, he had it up his sleeve. <laughs> My next trick, ladies and gentlemen, is the famous Hindustani rings. You will notice that they are apparently all separate. At a blow, they all join. Clang, 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 presto. And there was a general buzz of stupefaction till the quick man was heard to whisper, <laughs> The rings were up his sleeve. 
And then everyone all around the hall was whispering, the rings were up his sleeve. <laughs> the brow of the conjurer was clouded with a gathering frown. My next trick, ladies and gentlemen, is the most amusing trick whereby I am enabled to extract any number of eggs from a gentleman's hat. Will some kind gentleman please loan me his hat? Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> Presto, he extracted 17 eggs for 35 seconds, and the audience began to think that he was wonderful until <laughs> the quick man in the first row was heard to whisper, he had a hen up his sleeve. <laughs> and then all around the hall, everyone was whispering, he had a lot of hens up his sleeve. <laughs> it transpired from the whispers of the quick man that the conjurer must have had hidden up his sleeve, in addition to the rings, hens, and fish, several decks of playing cards, a loaf of bread, a doll's cradle, a live guinea pig, a 50 cent piece, and a rocking chair. <laughs> The reputation of the conjurer was rapidly sinking below zero. At the close of the evening, he rallied for a final effort. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I will now show you the Japanese trick recently invented by the natives of Tipperary. Will you, sir? <laughs> Turning towards the quick man, will you kindly loan me your gold watch? It was past him. And now, sir, have I your permission to put it into this mortar and to pound it to pieces? <laughs> the quick man nodded, smiled. The conjurer quickly threw the watch into the mortar. He grasped a sledgehammer from the table. There was a sound of violent smashing. <laughs> He's slipped it up his sleeve, whispered the quick man. And now, sir, will you loan me your silk handkerchief and allow me to punch holes in it for you? Thank you, sir. You will see, ladies and gentlemen, there is no deception. The holes are visible to the eye. The face of the quick man beamed. This time, the mystery of the thing really fascinated him. And now, sir, Will you loan me your silk hat and allow me to dance on it for you? Thank you, sir. <laughs> and now, sir, will you loan me your celluloid collar and allow me to burn it for you in this candle? Thank you, sir. <laughs> and now, sir, will you loan me your spectacles and allow me to smash them for you? Thank you, sir. <laughs> By this time, the features of the quick man were assuming a puzzled expression. <laughs> this thing beats me, he said. I don't see through it a bit. A hush fell on the audience. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have seen where I have, with this gentleman's permission, <coughs> burned his collar, smashed his spectacles, and danced on his hat. If he will give me further permission to paint green stripes on his overcoat, or to tie his suspenders in a knot, I will be happy to entertain you. If not, the performance is at an end. And amid a glorious burst of music from the orchestra, the curtain fell and the audience dispersed, knowing that there are some tricks, at any rate, that are not done. Up the conjurer's sleeve. <laughs> Now, yes? Ever seen any good card tricks? Here's a rather good one. Pick a card. No, thank you. I don't want a card. No, no, no. You pick a card, and I'll tell you what, what it is. You see? Pick a card. You tell who? No, I'll know which one you picked, don't you see? Go ahead, pick a card. Anyone I like? Yes. Any color? Yes, yes. <laughs> Any suit? Yes, yes, go ahead, pick a card. 
All right, I'll pick the ace of spades. Uh, confound it! No, no, I mean you're to pull it out of the pack. Oh, you want me to pull it out of the pack? <laughs> oh, now I understand. All right, hand me the pack. All right, I've got it. Have you picked it yet? Yes, it was the three of hearts. Did you know it? No, no. You're not supposed to tell me like that. You spoil it. Here, go ahead. Pick a card. All right, I've got it. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. There now, that's your card, isn't it? Well, I don't know. I lost sight of it. You lost sight of it? You're supposed to look at it and see which one it is. Oh. You want me to look at the front of it? Yes, yes, of course. Go ahead. Pick a card. All right. Now I understand. I've got it. Go ahead. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Flip. There now, that's your card, isn't it? Say now, did you put that card back in the pack? No, I kept it. Oh. <laughs> Listen, it's supposed to pick a card. Just one. Look at it. See which one it is. Remember it. Put it back in the pack. Do you understand? But I don't see how you're ever going to be able to do it. <laughs> you must be awfully clever. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Flip. There now. That's your card, isn't it? Now this is the supreme moment. <laughs> no. <laughs> that is not my card. Now this is a flat lie, but heaven will pardon you for it. It's not your card? Now, watch what you're at this time, will you? I don't understand this. I, I've done it for my mother, my father. Everybody comes around our place. Now, pick a card. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Flip. There now. That's your card, isn't it? No, I am sorry. <laughs> but that is not my card. But won't you try again? Perhaps you're a little bit nervous. I know I have been rather stupid. Why don't you go out on the back veranda and practice for a half hour or so? I'll... Oh, you have to go home. Well, I'm awfully sorry. It must be an awfully clever little trick. Good night. <laughs> I have often thought that the truest test of character of an individual can be found in the love letters that they write. Now, I submit for your approval a carefully selected set of love letters, both past and present. Uh, style number one is the old-fashioned style. It's a love letter of the year 1828 sent by messenger from Mr. Ardent Hartful, the hall, Knott's England, to Miss Angela Blushenburn, the shrubberies, hops, pots, shrops, England, <laughs> begging her acceptance of a fish. Respected Miss Angela, with the consent of your honored father and your esteemed mother, I venture to send to you by the messenger who bears you this, a fish. <laughs> it has, my respected Miss Angela, for some time been my most ardent desire that I might have the good fortune to present to you as the fruit of my own endeavors, a fish. <laughs> it was this morning my good fortune to land while angling in the stream that traverses your property with the consent of your father, a fish. <laughs> In presenting for your consumption with your parents' consent, respected Miss Angela, this fish, may I say that the fate of this fish, which will thus have the inestimable privilege of languishing upon your table, conveys nothing but envy to one who, while what he feels cannot be spoken, still feels as deeply as should feel, if it does feel, this fish. <laughs> your devoted Arden Hartzell. Now this is style two. It's the newer style of today. It's a love letter composed by Professor Albertus Dignus, 
the senior president of English rhetoric and diction at the university, and famous as the most brilliant essayist outside of the staff of the London Times, to Miss Maisie Beadit of the chorus of the Follies and Transit Company of Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> Cuckoo, my little Picherino, and how is she tonight? I wish she was right here, yum, yum. I got her Tootsie Weenie letter this morning. I hustled to the post office so fast, nearly broke my slats. And so it really longs for me, does she? And did you really mean it? Well, you certainly look like a piece of chocolate to me. In fact, you're some bird. You're my baby, all right, and so forth. For three pages, after which the professor turns back to work on his essay, The Deterioration of the English Language Yesterday and Today. <laughs> This is style three, truly rural. <laughs> it's a passionate love letter from Mr. Ephraim Cloverseed, Arcadia Post Office, Vermont, to Miss Nettie Singer, also of Arcadia, but at present at the cash at the home restaurant 7860 6th Avenue, New York. Oh, dear Nettie, there was a sharp frost last night which may do considerable harm to the fall wheat. Till last Tuesday, there had not been no frost that you wouldn't have noticed any. Some think we are in for a hard winter. Some think if it clears off a bit between this and New Year's, it may not be, but some don't. <laughs> I've seen a couple of crows in the pasture yesterday, but you can't always bank on that. I've been troubled again with my toe but my rheumatism seems a whole lot better from that last stuff. My left leg has been pretty stiff again, but the liniment has done my right arms good. Well, I will now close. Ephraim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, these are the letters, the answers that they got. The answer received by Mr. Har Ardent Hartful, Anno Domini 1828. Sir Joshua and Lady Blushenburn present their compliments to Mr. Ardent Hartful and desire to thank him for the fish. Wish Mr. Hartful has had the kindness to forward to their daughter and which they have greatly enjoyed. Sir Joshua and Lady Blushenburn will be pleased if Mr. Hartful will present himself in person for such future conversation in regards to this fish as connects it with his future intentions. <laughs> then, this is what the professor got. The answer from Miss Maisie Beat It of the Follies and Transit Company, Memphis, Tennessee. My dear professor, it was with the most agreeable feelings of gratification that I received your letter this morning. The sentiments which you express and the very evident manifestation thus conveyed of your affection towards myself fill me, sir, with the most lively satisfaction after which Maisie got tired of copying word for word from the complete letter writer. <laughs> and just added in her own style, wow, ain't you the kidder? Our next jump is Kansas City, Maisie. <laughs> and this is the womanly epistle sent from Miss Nettie Singer, Postal Station B28, New York, to the Arcadia Post Office, Vermont. Dear Ephraim, I was glad to get your letter. I was sorry to hear that there's been so much frost. I was glad to hear there are still crows in the bush. I was sorry to hear your toe is no better. I was glad to hear your rheumatism is some better. I am glad your leg is nicely. I must now close. Nettie. <laughs> Christmas, with its feeling of good cheer and peace on earth, Christmas with its feasting and merriment. Christmas with its... Well, anyway, it was Christmas. No, that's a slight slip. It wasn't exactly Christmas. It was Christmas Eve. Yes, it was Christmas Eve. And more than that, listen to where it was Christmas Eve. It was Christmas Eve on the old homestead. <laughs> you know it by sight, the old homestead. In the pauses of your work at your city desk where you have grown rich and avaricious, does it never rise before your mind's eye that quiet old homestead that knew you as a child before your greed of gold tore you away from it? <laughs> yes, it was Christmas Eve. The light 
shone through the window of the homestead farm. The light from the log fire rose and flickered and mingled its red glare on the window with the calm yellow of the lamplight. John Enderby and his wife sat in the kitchen of the homestead. Well, do you know it? The room called the kitchen with its open fire on the old brick hearth and the cook stove in the corner. It is the room of the homestead where the people cook and eat and live. John Enderby sat next to the plain deal table. His head bowed upon his hands, his grizzled face with its unshorn stubble, stricken down with the lines of devastating trouble. From time to time, he would rise and cast a fresh stick of tamarack on the fire with a savage thud that sent a shower of sparks up the chimney. On the other side of the fire sat his wife, Anna, in a straight-backed chair, staring into the fire with mute resignation. <coughs> what was wrong with them, anyway? <laughs> ah, can you ask? Do you know or remember so little of the old homestead? When I have said it is the old homestead and the uh, Christmas Eve, the farmer's in great trouble and throwing sticks of tamarack in the fire, surely you ought to be able to guess the old homestead was mortgaged. <laughs> yes. and the mortgage fell due tonight. Tonight at midnight, Christmas night, or I should say Christmas Eve night. So, the afflicted couple sat. Anna sat silent, or at times attempted to read. She had taken down from a small wall shelf Bunyan's Holy Living and Holy Dying. She tried to read it. She could not. Then she had taken Dante's Inferno. She could not read it. And then she had selected Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. She did not read it either. And lastly, she had taken the Farmer's Almanac of 1911. The books lay littered about her on the floor as she sat in patient despair. John Enderby showed all the passion of an uncontrolled nature. From time to time, he'd reach out for the crock of buttermilk that stood next to him and drain a draft of the maddening liquid till his brain glowed like the coals of the tamarack fire before him. <laughs> John, John, pleaded Anna, leave alone the buttermilk. It only maddens you. <laughs> no good will ever come of that. I laugh said John with a bitter laugh and burying his head again in the crock. What care I if it maddens me? John, John, you'd best be employed in reading the words of the good book than in your wild courses. Here, Father, take it and read it. And she handed to him the well-worn black volume from the shelf. Read it, John. In this hour of affliction, it brings comfort. The farmer took the well-worn black volume of Euclid's Elements, <laughs> and laying his hat aside in reverence, began to read aloud. The angles at the base of an isosceles triangle are equal, and whosoever shall produce the sides, lo, they also shall be equal each unto each. The farmer put the book aside. It's no use, Anna, I can't read the good words tonight. And then he staggered towards the buttermilk, and before she could stay his hand, he drained it to the last drop. John, John, let them foreclose it if they will. I am past all caring. And then John sank back down into his chair. Anna sat and looked into the fire sadly. Alas, if only her son Henry had been with them. Henry who had left them three years earlier and whose letters still brought from time to time a glimmer of hope to the stricken farmhouse. Henry was in Sing Sing. <laughs> his letters, his letters brought news to his mother of his steady success. He was the first of the baseball nine of the prison, the favorite of the chaplains and the, the warden, 
the best bridge player in the corridor. No, Henry was pushing himself to the front with the old time spirit of the Enderbys. Oh. Anna had uh, hoped that he might be with her at Christmas time, but Henry had written that it was practically impossible for him to get away from Sing Sing. But <laughs> the guards, the guards were planning a, a party and a slaying party for the celebration that he had hopes, he said, of slipping away uh, unnoticed, but his doing so might excite attention. No, Henry would not come. There was no hope there. Oh, and William, the other son, Ten years older than Henry. Alas, William had gone forth from the homestead to fight his way in the great city. When I make a million dollars, mother, I'll come home. Till then, goodbye. And he had gone. Oh, how Anna's heart had beat for him. Would he ever make that million dollars? Would she ever live to see it? And as the years passed, she and John used to sit in the evenings and picture William coming home again bringing with him the million dollars. Or better still, sending the million dollars by express with love. <laughs> the years passed, and John never came. No, the great city had swallowed him up as it has so many another lad from the old homestead. Anna started from her musing. What was that at the door? The sound of a soft and timid rapping. And through the door pane, a face, a woman's face, staring into the lamp-lit room with pleading eyes. And what was that she bore? That bundle that she held so tight to her breast to shield it from the falling snow. Can you not guess? <laughs> well, try three guesses and see. <laughs> right you are, that's what it was. So Anna went hastily to the door. Lord, mercy, child, what are you doing out on a night like this? Come in, child, to the fire. And the woman entered, carrying the bundle with her, and looking with wide eyes. They were at least an inch and a half across. <laughs> at John Enderby and his wife, Anna noticed that she had no wedding ring on her hand. Mm -hmm. Your name? asked the farmer's wife. Caroline, she answered. And I seek shelter. <laughs> and then she paused. And I want you to take the child. Well, Anna took the child and safely put it away on the top shelf of the cupboard and then went <laughs> to get a uh, glass of water and a donut and put it before the half-frozen girl. Eat, she said, and warm yourself. John Enderby rose from the chair. I'll have no child of that sort in my house, he said. John, John, pleaded Anna, remember the words of the good book. Things that are equal to the same thing are equal to one another. John Enderby sank back down into his chair. And why had Caroline no wedding ring? Well, can't you guess? <laughs> well, you can't guess. It isn't what you think at all, so there. Caroline had no wedding ring because she threw it away one night in bitter disappointment as she tramped the streets of the great city. Why, she said, should the wife of a man in a penitentiary wear a ring? And then she had gone forth with her child from what had been their home. Oh, it was the old sad story. She had taken the child and laid it gently, tenderly on a bench in the park. And then she walked rapidly away. A little while after, a man came running after her with a bundle in his arms. Excuse me, madam, he said, but I think you left your child in the park. <laughs> Caroline thanked him. And then she took it to the Grand Central waiting room, <laughs> kissed it tenderly and put it on a shelf behind the lunch counter. A little while after, an official beaming with satisfaction brought it back to her. Yours, I think, madam. <laughs> Caroline thanked him. And then she had uh, left it at the desk of the Waldorf Astoria. The ticket off of the, of the subway, it always came back. <laughs> Somewhere, she murmured, I shall find a door of kindness open to it. Anna, with true woman's kindness, asked no question. She saw the baby safely away in a trunk and saw Caroline to bed in the best room and resumed her seat by the fire. John Enderby sat brooding in his chair. The old clock struck 20 minutes past eight. <laughs> <laughs> the 
the fire flickered down. Then John Enderby rose and taking the lantern from a hook, mortgage or no mortgage, he said, I must see to the stock. And he passed out of the house. He paused for a moment in the yard and looked out over the snow to the cedar swamp and beyond with the snow winding through it in the far distance, the lights of the village far away. John looked out over the swamp and sighed. Down in the swamp, two miles away, could he have but seen it, there moved a sleigh, and within it, a man in a sealskin coat and silk hat, and around his waist, a belt containing a million dollars in gold coin. <laughs> he halted his horse in an opening in the road, removed the belt, and proceeded to count the coins. Next to the man, crouched in the bushes at the dark edge of the swamp road, with eyes that watched every glitter of the coins and a hand that held a heavy cudgel of blackthorn was a man whose close-cropped hair and hard-lined face belonged nowhere but within the walls of Sing Sing. <laughs> when the carriage moved onward, the man in the bushes followed doggedly in its tracks. Meanwhile, John Enderby had made the rounds of the outbuildings. When he got back to the house, the sleigh was sitting on the roadway. Anna met him at the doorway. John, she said, a stranger came calling while you were in the barn, uh, seeking shelter for the night, a city man, I reckon, by his clothes. And, well, I couldn't refuse him, so I gave him Willie's room. We'll never need it again, and he's going to sleep. Aye, we can't refuse him, said John. And he took the horse to the barn and then resumed his vigil next to Anna by the fire. Meanwhile, in the room upstairs, the man in the sealskin coat had thrown himself down on the bed, clothes and all, tired from his drive. Oh, how it all comes back to me, he said. <laughs> the same old room, nothing's changed, except then, how worn they look. And then a tear started to his eyes. And then he thought about leaving the homestead 15 years ago of his fight in the great city, of the great new idea he had of making money, of the farm investment loan company he instituted, the simple idea of applying the crushing power of capital to extract the uttermost penny from the farm loans. And here he was, back home again, true to his word, with a million dollars in his belt, and tomorrow he would tell them, tomorrow it was Christmas. And now William, yes, it was William, had fallen asleep. The hours passed and kept passing. It was 11.30. Anna started from her place. Henry, she cried as the door opened and a man entered. Yes, it was Henry, the man from Sing Sing. True to his word, he had slipped away unostentatiously at the height of the festivities. <laughs> oh. Alas, said Anna after the warmth of them. Yes, said Anna not even a bed to offer you. And then she told him of the strangers who had come calling, the stricken woman with the child and the rich man with the sealskin coat seeking shelter for the night. By heaven, Father, I have it, cried Henry. And then speaking low, he said, Speak low, Father. This man upstairs, has he a sealskin coat and silk hat? Aye, said John Enderby. Father, said Henry, I saw a man sitting in the swamp, in a sleigh, chuckling, and he counted his money. Five dollar gold pieces and all one million one hundred twenty five thousand six hundred forty five dollars and a quarter. The two men stared at one another. I see your point, said John Enderby. Well, choke him, said Henry. Or club him, said the father, and pay off the mortgage. Anna looked from one to the other, joy and hope struggling with the sorrow in her face. Oh, my Henry, my dear Henry, I knew he would find a way. Come now, said Henry, you take the lantern, mother, and you the club father, and gaily, but with hushed voices, the three of them stole up the stairs. The stranger lay sunk in sleep. The back of his head was to them as they came in. Now, mother, said John Enderby, hold the lamp a little nearer, just behind the ear, I think. Henry, no, father, said Henry, rolling up his sleeves as he talked with quick authority that set well upon him. Across the jaw, father, it's quicker and neater. Well, well, said John Enderby proudly. Uh, you know best, son, have it your own way. <laughs> and Henry raised high the club. But as he did, stay. What was that? From far off, 
in the distance, behind the cedar swamp, came the big booming of a church bell tolling out the hour of midnight. Bong, bong, bong. Its tones came clear across the crisp air. They seemed to usher in the morning of Christmas with its message of peace and goodwill. Henry let the club fall and it rattled to the floor. The stranger woke and sat up. Father, mother, said William. My son, my son, cried John. We knew it was you. We had come to wake you. <laughs> yes, it is I, William, and I have brought with me the million dollars. And with that, he unstrapped his belt and laid the million dollars on the table before him. Oh, thank heavens, cried Anna. And now all our troubles are at an end. We can help pay off the mortgage and the greed of Pitchum and company cannot harm us. The farm was mortgaged, cried William aghast. Aye, son, to men who have no conscience, whose greedy hand has nearly driven us to the grave. See how she has aged, my son. And he pointed to Anna. Father, said William with deep tones of contrition, I am Pinchum and company. Oh, great heavens, I see it all now. To what extent of suffering my fortune was raised. I shall restore it all, these million dollars, to those people I have wronged. No, said Anna. <laughs> you repent, dear son, with true Christian repentance. That is enough. We may keep the money. <laughs> we will think of it as a trust. A sacred trust. And he folded her to his heart. Gaily, the reunited family descended. Anna carried the lantern. Henry carried the club. William carried the million dollars. <laughs> the tamarack fire roared again on the hearth. The buttermilk was passed from one to the other. Henry and William told the stories of their adventures. And the first morning light of Christmas came through the door pane. Ah, my son, said John Enderby proudly. Henceforth, let us stick to the narrow path. What is it the words of the good book say? A straight line is that which lies evenly between its extreme points. <laughs> Now time for a break, a little interval, have a cup of tea, whatever you like. I've got my own back here. I'll be out in about 10, 12 minutes. See you later. Uh -huh. which I was contained while night was almost falling, entered upon the long and gloomy avenue that leads to Buggam Grange. A resounding shriek echoed throughout the woods as I entered the avenue. I thought little of it at the time, judging it to be merely one of those resounding shrieks that one is liable to hear at such a time and such a place. But I found myself wondering, as my drive continued, however, in spite of myself, why such a resounding shriek should have been uttered at the very moment of my approach. <laughs> now, the uh, Grange is situated in the loneliest part of England, the marsh country of the Fens, 
to which civilization has still hardly penetrated. The inhabitants of whom there are one and one half to a square mile live here and there among the fens and eke out a miserable existence by frog fishing or <laughs> catching flies. Here and there where the ground rises above the level of the fens are dank, dense woods tangled with parasitic creepers filled with owls and bats and heavy with the dank odors of deadly nightshade <laughs> and poisoned ivy. <laughs> it had been raining on the afternoon of my approach, and as I proceeded down the avenue, the mournful dripping of the rain from the dark trees accentuated the cheerlessness of the gloom. <laughs> Seldom, I may say, have I had a drive of so mournful a character. Presently, the avenue opened out upon the lawn with its overgrown shrubberies, and in the half-darkness, I could just make out the outline of the Grange itself, a rambling, dilapidated old building. A dim light struggled through the casement of a tower window, and save for a melancholy cry of a row of owls on the roof, and the croaking of the frogs in the moat which ran around the grounds, the place was soundless. My driver halted his horse on the hither side of the moat, and no sooner had I alighted, but he wheeled his cab about and made off! <laughs> laughing heartily at the fellow's trepidation. <laughs> I have a way of laughing heartily in the dark. I made my way to the door and pulled the bell handle. I could hear the muffled reverberations of the bell far within the building, and then all was silent. I bent my ear to listen, but could hear nothing, except, save perhaps a sound of a person moaning, as in pain or in great mental distress. <laughs> Convinced, however, from what my friend, Sir Jeremy Buggam, had told me that the Grange was not empty, I raised high the ponderous door knocker, began to beat with it loudly on the door. But perhaps I should at this time uh, explain to you all how I came to be knocking at the door of Buggam Grange at nightfall on a gloomy November evening. It was about a year before when I was with my friend Sir Jeremy, the present baronet, on the uh, veranda of his ranch in California. So, you don't believe in the supernatural at all, he was saying. <laughs> Not in the slightest, I answered as I lit a cigar as I spoke. When I want to light a uh, cigar as I speak, I always try to appear positive that way. Well, at any rate, uh, Digby, the Grange is uh, haunted. If you want to be assured of it, you can go down there, spend a night, and see for yourself. <laughs> My dear fellow, I would be delighted. Nothing would give me greater pleasure. I was uh, supposed to be in England in uh, six weeks. Nothing would give me greater pleasure than to put your theory to the test. And now tell me, I added somewhat cynically, uh, is there any uh, special season or day when your Grange is supposed to be especially terrible? Sir so Jeremy looked at me rather strangely. Like, Why do you ask that, he said. Do you know the story of the Grange? I never heard of the place before in my life, I said cheerily. Until you mentioned it tonight, I hadn't the slightest idea that you still owned property back in England. Well, at any rate, the, the Grange is shut up. It has been for 20 years, but I keep a man there. Horrid. He was a butler in my father's day, and before him, 
If you're going, I'll write him and tell him you're coming. And since you are taking your fate in your hands, the 15th of November is the day. Just then, Lady Buggam and Clara and all the other girls trooped back out onto the veranda and the whole thing went out clean out of my mind. Nor did I think of it again until I was back in England. And then by one of those strange coincidences or premonitions, call it what you will, I suddenly awoke one morning and realized it was the 15th of November. Now, whether Sir Jeremy had written horrid or not, I did not know. But at any rate, nightfall found me, as I have described, beating <laughs> on the door of Buggam Grange. <laughs> the sound of the knocker had scarcely ceased to echo when I could hear the sound of shuffling footsteps within and the sound of bolts and chains being withdrawn. The door opened, and a man appeared, carrying a lighted candle and shielding it with his hand. His faded black clothes, once evidently a butler's uniform, his white hair, his advanced age, left me in no doubt that he was horrid, of whom... <laughs> Sir Jeremy had spoken. Without a word, he beckoned me come in. And still without speech, he helped me remove my wet outer garments and then beckoned me into a great hall, evidently the dining room of the Grange. Now, I am not by any degree a nervous man by temperament, but there was something in the vastness of this wainscoted room, lighted only by a single candle, and in the emptiness of this still house, and still more in the presence of my speechless attendant, which rendered me, well, gave me a feeling of at least uneasiness. Sir Jeremy told me, I said as loudly and as heartily as I could, that he would apprise you of my coming. In answer, Harid raised his fingers to his lips. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized at once that he could neither speak nor hear. Now, I am not a nervous man. Oh, I, I think I said that, but... <laughs> The realization that my sole companion in this empty house could neither speak nor hear struck a cold chill to my heart. <laughs> now, Harid lay before me a uh, cold goose, a cold meat pie, a cheese, and a tall flagon of cider, but my appetite was gone. I finished the goose, but having finished the pie, I found that I had very little zest left for the cheese, which I finished without enjoyment. <laughs> the cider had a sour taste, and after having permitted Harren to refill the flagon twice, I, I found that it produced a state of melancholy, and I decided to drink no more. <laughs> the meal finished, Harid picked up the lighted candle, and beckoned me follow him. We passed on through the dark corridors of the house. A long line of pictured buggums looked upon us <laughs> as we passed. Harid led me up the stairs, and I realized he was taking me to the tower in the east wing where I had observed a light. Now, the rooms to which he led me consisted of a sitting room and an adjoining bedroom, both fitted with antique wainscoting against which a faded tapestry fluttered. Now, there was a lighted candle on the table in the sitting room, but its insufficient light just rendered the surroundings all the more dismal. Harrod bent over the fireplace there and attempted to light a fire, but the wood was evidently uh, damp, and the fire just flickered feebly on the hearth. The butler left me, and in the emptiness of that house, I could hear his shuffling steps echo down the corridor 
Then all was silent. It may have been fancy, but it appeared to me that his departure was a signal for something like a low moan <laughs> that came from the other side of the wainscot. There was a narrow cupboard door on one side of the room, and it occurred to me that the sound must have come from within. I uh, decided not to look on the other side of the door. <laughs> Instead, I seated myself in a great chair opposite the feeble fire. Mm. I must have been seated there for some time when my eyes suddenly arose to the mantelpiece above, and there upon it was a letter addressed to me. I recognized at once the handwriting to be that of Sir Jeremy Buggam. I opened the letter, and spread it out before the feeble flame and read as follows. My dear Digby, in our talk that you will remember, I had no time to finish telling you about the mystery of Buggam Grange. I take for granted that you will go there, however, and that horrid will put you in the tower rooms, which are the only ones that make any pretense of being habitable. I have therefore sent him this letter to deliver at the Grange itself. The story is this. On the night of the 15th of November, 50 years ago, my grandfather was murdered in the room in which you are sitting. <laughs> by his cousin, Sir Duggam Buggam. <laughs> he was stabbed from behind while seated at the little table at which you are probably reading this letter. <clears throat> The two had been playing cards at the table, and my grandfather's body was found lying in a litter of cards and gold sovereigns on the floor. Sir Duggam Buggam, insensible from drink, lay beside him, the fatal knife at his hand, his fingers smeared with blood. My grandfather, though of the younger branch, possessed a part of the estates which were to revert to Sir Duggam Buggam on his death. Sir Duggam Buggam was tried and was hanged. On the day of his execution, he was permitted by the authorities, out of respect for his rank, to wear a mask to the scaffold. <sighs> the clothes in which he was executed are hanging at full length in the little cupboard to your right. <laughs> And the mask is above them. <laughs> it is said that on every 15th of November at midnight, the cupboard door opens and Sir Duggam Buggam walks out into the room. <laughs> It has been found impossible to get servants to remain at the Grange. <laughs> and the place, except for the presence of Horrid, has been unoccupied for a generation. At the time of the murder, Horrid was a young man of 22, newly entered into the service of the family. It was he who entered the room and discovered the crime on the day of the execution, he was stricken with paralysis and was never spoken since. From that time to this, he has never consented to leave the Grange where he lives in isolation. Wishing you a pleasant night after your tiring journey. <laughs> I remain very faithfully Jerry Bumbuggum.
Now, I have as little faith in the supernatural as anyone, but there was something in the surroundings in which I now found myself which rendered me at least uncomfortable. You may smile, if you will, but it was with a very great degree of difficulty that I finally managed to rise up out of my chair and grasping a candle in one hand, back slowly into the bedroom. As I backed into it, something so like a moan seemed to proceed from the closed cupboard door that I accelerated my movement to a considerable degree. I hastily blew out the candle, threw myself on the bed, and pulled the bed covers up over my head, leaving, however, one eye and one ear still out and available. <laughs> How long I lay thus, I cannot tell. The stillness was absolute. From time to time, I thought I heard the distant cry of an owl. And once, very far off in the building below, the sound as of uh, a person dragging a chain across the floor. And more than once, I was well, stroke of midnight. The cupboard door in the other room opened. Now, there was no need to ask me how I knew it. I couldn't, of course, see it, but I could hear or sense in some way the sound of it. By this time, the hair on my head was beginning to stand on end. <laughs> I was aware that there was a presence in the other room. Not a person, a living soul, mind you, but a presence. Anyone who has ever been in the next room to a presence will know exactly how I felt. <laughs> By this time, my hair was perpendicular. <laughs> I could hear the sound as of a, 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 a groping on the floor and a rattle as of coins. And then at this precise moment from far off in the building below, a prolonged and piercing cry as of a soul passing in agony. Now, you may censure me or not, but at this very moment, I decided to beat it. <laughs> Whether I should have stuck around or not to find out what happened is a subject I will not discuss. My object was to get out and to get out quickly. Now, the window of the room that I was in was some 25 feet above the ground. I sprang through the casement and landed on the ground in one leap. <laughs> I jumped over the shrubberies in one jump. I cleared the moat in one jump, and I ran down the avenue in six strides, and I ran the five miles along the fence through the woods in three minutes. This, at least, is an accurate transcription of my sensations and may have taken longer. But I didn't stop until I found myself on the threshold of Buggam Arms in Little Buggam Village, beating on the door for the landlord. Now, I returned to Buggam Grange the next day in the bright sunlight of a frosty November morning in a seven-cylinder motor car with six local constables and a physician. <laughs> it makes all the difference. <laughs> <laughs> we carried pickaxes, shovels, spades, revolvers, shotguns, and a Ouija board. <laughs> What we found cleared up the mystery of Buggam Grange. We discovered Horrid lying on the dining room floor, quite dead. Now, the physician said that he had died of heart failure. There was evidence from the marks of his shoes in the dust that he had come in the night to the tower room. And there on the table, he had left a paper. And within it contained a full confession of his having murdered Sir Jeremy Buggam 50 years before. 
The circumstances of the evening made it easy for him to fasten the crime on Sir Duggum Buggum, already insensible from drink. A few moments on the Ouija board allowed us to get a full cooperation from Sir Duggum. <laughs> <laughs> and what's more, now that his name was cleared, he promised to leave the premises forever. <laughs> My friend, the present Sir Jeremy has had the Grange rehabilitated. The house is rebuilt. The moat is drained. The entire house is lit with electricity. There are beautiful motor drives in all directions through the woods. The owls have been stuffed. The bats shot. <laughs> and his daughter, Clara Buggum, became my wife. She's in the wings now watching me as I speak. Well, what more could I want? <laughs> Twenty years ago, I knew a man called Jiggins who had the health habit. He used to take a cold plunge every morning. He said it opened his pores. <laughs> After it, he would take a hot sponge. He said it closed his pores. <laughs> he got so that he could open and shut his pores at will. <laughs> every morning, he would stand in front of an open window for half an hour, breathing. He said it expanded his lungs. He could, of course, had it done in a shoe store with a boot stretcher, but <laughs> after all, it cost him nothing this way, and what is half an hour? After he got his undershirt on, he would hitch himself up in a harness like a dog and do sandow exercises. He did them forwards, backwards, and hind side up. He got so he could have got a job as a dog anywhere. <laughs> he spent most of his time at this sort of thing. In his spare time in the office, he used to lie down on the floor and see if he could pick himself up by his knuckles. If he could, then he'd try some other way until he found one way that he couldn't do. <laughs> He would spend the rest of his lunch hour on the floor perfectly happy. <laughs> in the evenings, in his room, he would lift iron bars, cannonballs, heave dumbbells, haul himself up to the ceiling with his teeth. You could hear the thumps half a mile. He liked it. He spent half of his evening slinging himself around the room like this. He said it made his brain clear. As soon as he got his brain perfectly clear, he went to bed and slept. In the morning when he woke, he began clearing it again. <laughs> Jiggins is dead. Now he was, of course, a pioneer, but the fact that he dumbbelled himself to death <laughs> does not stop a whole generation of young people from following in his path. They are ridden by the health mania. They make themselves a nuisance. When they get up at impossible hours, they put on these silly little suits and run marathon heats before breakfast. They go around barefoot to get the dew on their feet. They hunt for ozone. They bother about pepsin. They won't eat meat because it has too much nitrogen. They won't eat fruit because it hasn't any. They prefer albumin and starch and nitrogen to huckleberry pie and donuts. They won't drink water out of a tap. They won't eat sardines out of a can. They won't use oysters out of a pail. They won't drink milk out of a glass. And they're afraid of alcohol in any shape. Yes, they're afraid. Cowards! <laughs> and after all this fuss, they presently incur some simple old-fashioned illness and die like anybody else. <laughs> Now, 
people of this sort have no chance to attain any great age. <laughs> they are on the wrong track. <laughs> Listen, do you want to live to be really old? To enjoy a grand, green, exuberant, boastful old age and make yourselves a nuisance in your neighborhood with your reminiscences? <laughs> Well, cut out all this nonsense. Cut it out. The time to get up in the morning is when you have to, not before. <laughs> if your office opens at 11, get up at 10.30. If work begins at 7, get up at 10 minutes too. But don't be liar enough to say that you like it. It isn't exhilarating and you know it. And drop all this cold bath business. You never did it as a boy. Don't be a fool now. If you must take a bath, and you probably don't really need to. <laughs> Take it warm. The pleasure of getting out of a cold bed and slipping into a warm bath beats a cold plunge to death. <laughs> and anyway, oh, now, on the subject of uh, germs and bacilli, don't be afraid of them. <laughs> That's all. That's the whole thing. If you once get onto that, you never need to worry again. If you see a bacilli, you walk right up to it and stare it in the eye. <laughs> if one flies into your room at night, you strike at it with a hat or a towel. You hit it as hard as you can between the neck and the thorax. It'll soon get sick of that. <laughs> as a matter of fact, a bacilli is perfectly quiet and harmless if you're not afraid of it. Speak to it. Call out to it to lie down. It will understand. <laughs> I had a bacilli once called Fido. He used to come and lie at my feet while I was working. Now, I never had a more affectionate companion. And when it was run over by an automobile, I buried it in the garden with genuine sorrow. Well, I'll admit that is an exaggeration. I don't remember its name. It may have been Robert. <laughs> Now, understand that it is only a fad of modern medicine to say that uh, cholera and typhoid and diphtheria are caused by germs and bacilli. It's nonsense. Cholera is caused by a frightful pain in the stomach. <laughs> <laughs> and diphtheria is caused by trying to cure a sore throat. Now, <clears throat> on the subject of food, eat all you want. Eat lots of it. Yes, eat too much of it. Eat so you can just stagger across the room with it and prop it up against the sofa cushion. <laughs> eat everything you like until you can't eat anything more. The only test is, can you pay for it? <laughs> if you can't pay for it, don't eat it. And now, just one more word about fresh air and exercise. Don't bother with either of them. Get your room full of good air and then shut the windows tight and keep it. It'll keep for years. And please, stop using your lungs all the time. Let them rest. And one more word about exercise. If you have to take it, take it and put up with it. But as long as you have the price of a hack, you can hire other people to play baseball for you and run races and do gymnastics when you can sit in the shade and relax and eat and drink and watch them. Great heavens. What more do you want? <sighs> the faded actor. There he stands in his bell-shaped coat, drawn at the waist and ample in the skirt. His battered hat that he uses with his elaborate gestures and holds over his heart as he takes a bow is but the wreck of a hat that was. His faded trousers tight upon his legs, drawn downward with a strap, carrying with them the lingering suggestion of the days of Vaux Brummel and George IV. His ample buttons are pierced out with string, his frilled cuffs, are ostentatious in their raggedness. From top to toe, his creators have made a guy of him. 
a mean parody of forgotten graces. When he speaks, his voice is raucous and rotund. There is something of Shakespeare in it and something of gin. His face is a blossom that has bloomed over much. His feet move in long, fitless shoes, so worn that they slide noiselessly across the stage. And beneath his arm, as if to complete the pathos of his figure, is a rolled up copy of his manuscript, which he himself composed, and the managers, shame be to them, refuse to produce. In a thousand plays and parodies, you shall see this figure of the faded actor, a stock object of our undying ridicule. It is a signal for our laughter when he takes a drink, fawning to get it and then swallowing it as if into a funnel. It is a signal for our laughter when he catches for a coin, the smallest one not coming amiss. And it is a signal for our laughter when he arranges with elaborate care upon his uplifted wrist the ruins of his cuff. And when he brings forth from beneath his arm his faded manuscript and stands forth to read what no one will hear except in mockery with his poor self carried away unconscious with the art of it. Mark him now as he strikes his attitude to read. Hear the full voice, deep and resident for all the gin that is in it. For no parody can once remove the majesty of that, nor the grace that has once lived in those queer gestures. For in the faded actor, with his twists and graces, his futile manuscript, his blighted hopes, his unredeemed ambitions, we are looking at all that is best in the great traditions of the stage. That full, deep voice, comic now, but once revered, that quick sliding step so funny to our eye, and that long gesticulation of the hand revealing the bare wrist below the cuff. Name more. There is something in the soul of the faded actor that all may envy who have in this life busied themselves with the aesthetic arts. For what does he want? poor battered guy with his outlandish braces and queer gestures. Money? Not he. He never had nor ever dreamed of any. Or perhaps a coin here or there to buy a dram of gin or some broad cheap writing paper on which to inscribe his thoughts. This much he asks. But beyond that, his ambition never goes for it travels elsewhere and by another road. His soul, at least, is free of the taint that is smeared across the arts by the money rewards of a commercial age. He lived too soon to hear of the many millions a year that crown success and kill out genius, that substitute publicity for fame, that tempt a man to do the work that pays and neglect the promptings of his soul and that turn the field of the arts into one great glare of notoriety and noise. Not so worked and lived as Shakespeare or Michelangelo, and the faded actor descends directly from them. Art for art's sake is his only creed, unconscious though it may be. Someone to listen to his lines. An audience, if only in a barn, beside the hedgerow. A certain meed of praise, which is the breath of art and the inspiration of effort. This much he asks, and no more. To him, therefore, I dedicate this evening I make this dedication as a humble tribute to the high principles of art that are embodied in the faded actor. <laughs> OK.
Okay. Thank you. I just noticed from the, uh, this morning's daily press that a uh, Professor Plum of the University of Chicago has just invented a highly concentrated form of food. All the essential nutritive elements are put together in the form of pellets, each of which contain from one to two hundred times as much nourishment as an ounce of ordinary article of diet. These pellets diluted with water will form all that is necessary to support life. The professor looks forward confidently to revolutionizing the present food system. Well, this may be all very well in its way, but it's going to have its drawbacks as well. In the not too distant future, I can imagine such scenes as the following. The smiling family were gathered round the hospitable board. The table was plentifully laid with a soup plate in front of each beaming child. A bucket of hot water before the radiant mother. <laughs> and at the head of the board, the Christmas dinner of the happy home, warmly covered by a thimble and resting on a poker chip. <laughs> the expectant whispers of the little ones were hushed as the father, rising from his chair, lifted the thimble and disclosed a small pill of concentrated nourishment on the chip before him. Christmas turkey, cranberry sauce, plum pudding, mince pie, it was all there. All jammed into that little pill and only waiting to expand. <laughs> then the father, with deep reverence and a devout eye alternating between the pill and heaven, lifted his voice in benediction. At this moment, there was an agonized cry from the mother. Oh, Henry, quick! Baby has snatched the pill! <laughs> It was all too true. Dear little Gustavus Adolphus, <laughs> the golden-haired baby boy had grabbed the whole Christmas dinner off the poker chip and bolted it. <laughs> 350 pounds of concentrated nourishment passed down the esophagus of the unthinking child. <laughs> Clap him on the back, cried the distracted mother. <laughs> Give him water. Well, the idea was fatal. <laughs> <laughs> the water striking the pill caused it to expand. There was a dull, rumbling sound. And then with an awful... Bang! <laughs> Gustavus Adolphus exploded into <laughs> fragments. <coughs> and when they had gathered the little corpse together, <laughs> the baby lips were parted in a lingering smile that could only be worn by a child who had eaten 13 Christmas dinners. <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs> oh, I might as well go out. <clears throat> Thank you.
now. Take a bow tonight, but uh, I'd like Tom to come out. Oh, God, now I'm going to be embarrassed. A little surprise for him. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce to you the mayor of Portsmouth, uh, Bronner, Mary Queen. Mary? What are you doing? Oh, thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the citizens of Portsmouth, I would like to read this proclamation to you. Whereas Tom Selly came to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in the fall of 1967 to join the newly formed professional acting company called Theatre by the Sea, and whereas he devoted most of his professional life to Theatre by the Sea in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, during the next 19 years, <clears throat> contributing so much to the cultural life and bringing great honor to the city of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, as actor, director, teacher, and administrator, not only by his high standards and his own fine performance and excellent teaching, but by his thoughtful selection of plays for each season. And whereas he has helped us to dream, made us think, stirred our emotions, given us great pleasure and new ways of looking at ourselves and the world. Now therefore, I, Mary M. Keenan, Mayor of the City of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, proclaim May 31st, 1986, be observed as Tom Shelley Day and call upon our citizens to join in saluting Tom Shelley for all he has given us and wishing him well in his new endeavors. In witness thereof, I have here unto set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to be affixed this 13th day of, excuse me, 30, 30th day of May in the year of our Lord, 1986. Congratulations and good luck. Good luck to you. Go home. <laughs>